Hello, everyone, and welcome to Story Maps Live. My name is Ross Donahue, and I'm hosting this webinar from Washington, D.C. today. Um, before we, we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Piscataway and the Topchik, on which uh, we are learning, organizing, and hosting this webinar today. I also want to use this opportunity to share a resource uh, for you all to learn more about whose land you're on and invite you to share in uh, the webinar chat um, the, the, the lands that you're on. So in the chat, there's this resource called uh, nativeland.ca. When you go there, you can uh, actually type in your address and see uh, the land that you reside in. Um, so feel free to share in the chat um, as a way of uh, raising awareness around um, ancestral lands. The first part of our webinar is focused on uh, getting started with ArcGIS story maps. And then we will update you on the latest updates to ArcGIS story maps um, and hear from our featured storyteller and do a live Q&A session. So with that, I'll hand things over to the founder of Esri's story maps team, Alan Carroll. Great, thanks a lot, Ross. Uh, thanks, and thanks everybody for, for coming. Hope, uh, hope you enjoy the session today. Um, apologies in advance that there's some background noise having some work done on the house and there's been quite, quite a bit of hammering and stuff going on this morning. So let me share my screen and jump right in. I'm gonna move relatively quickly because uh, I'm excited about our, our guest speaker today and really want to leave as much time to him as possible. But uh, first, uh, I thought I'd quickly go over the basics of story maps. Most of you probably are already pretty familiar with, with what story maps are about, but just in case, uh, we'll run through the basics. So what are ArcGIS story maps? They combine interactive maps, uh, sometimes static maps too, but interactive maps that are hosted on Esri's cloud service, ArcGIS Online, with multimedia content. So your photos, your videos, your audio, and text, of course, from you to tell stories about the world. And I mean, by about the world, I mean about all scales from neighborhoods to the uh, planet wide, occasionally other planets, uh, and all sorts of topics from really important uh, uh, issues and concerns uh, to things like uh, uh, personal travel logs and wedding invites. Uh, they serve on a, uh, they, they work on a variety of screen sizes. So in other words, they're responsive and with uh, with our latest generation storytelling tools, we've worked really hard to make, uh, make them just as beautiful on mobile, tablets, and PCs. They incorporate interactive builders. So this means that you don't need to have any web development skills. I have absolutely none myself, and I can do a pretty good job of assembling stories, mainly through our, our builder function and, and what's at the heart of it, which we call the block palette. So imagine each one of these items as, as a building block that you can then assemble and reassemble into these beautiful narratives. Uh, their story maps are hosted by Esri in the cloud. Uh, and all that means is that you don't have to worry about hosting. It also makes your stories accessible or to automatic or periodic updates. And I'll, I'll talk to you in a couple of minutes about the latest rounds of updates. Uh, also, we claim no ownership to your stories. They're just a place to uh, essentially park them. We started uh, about 10 years ago now with what became a, a series of classic apps, uh, each of which separately presented a different user experience for combining maps and multimedia content. But about three years ago, we realized that it was time to move on from that and to kind of unify those user, ex user experiences into a single builder and update design and other functions. And so the result is uh, ArcGIS story maps. And since its release going on a couple of years ago, we've been constantly refining and updating and expanding the capabilities of our GIS story maps. They've grown uh, incredibly rapidly in popularity. This has been such a thrill for us to witness. So we've had not quite exponential growth, but, but pretty, uh, pretty steep and continuing growth. We're now approaching 1.7 million story maps hosted on, on uh, ArcGIS online with I think the potential for myriads of uh, additional stories. It's also been a thrill for us to see the organizations that are using story maps, including um, many US federal agencies, EPA and NOAA each have 
uh, well over a thousand story maps. USGS has probably dozens to hundreds, as does the National Park, Park Service, Forest Service, uh, Bureau of Land Management, etc. Lots of nonprofits, uh, leading nonprofits like the Nature Conservancy and National Audubon Society, Royal Society for Protection of Birds, Doctors Without Borders, etc., are publishing story maps. Uh, as are um, venerable institutions like the Smithsonian and National Geographic. They've also, meanwhile, uh, really kind of exploded in the classroom, which has uh, been really exciting to us. Uh, so about a third, we think, of Story Maps users uh, come from the education community, which is, uh, again, a really exciting phenomenon. Uh, we'll tell you more about where to go for information, but the best place to get started is esri.com slash story maps. Now I'm going to jump over and talk to you about the latest couple of rounds of uh, enhancements. So it being spring, just think of these new enhancements as, uh, as new blossoms that have uh, been added to the, the garden that is ArcGIS story maps. Uh, and there's some that I'm particularly excited about. So one is we've just made kind of a basic design refresh. Uh, so when you land on your uh, stories page, you'll see a, a, a new format that we think is a good bit more accessible. So uh, right here in the upper left, you can go from stories to collections to themes, and we've uh, so you can see how these look. Um, and we've also uh, kind of moved and reorganized the quick links to make them more accessible. So you've got right there at your fingertips access to lots of background information about how to make a story and other, other material. Um, we've also made a change to the builder so that there's a separate header for the builder. Uh, it can sometimes, it used to be sometimes confusing between what your readers will see and what you're seeing in the, in the builder. So that's, that's now changed. Uh, one, that, one thing that I'm really excited about is you can now apply your custom themes to your story collections. Uh, and here's some examples. So this is a collection I put together of some of my favorite travel and destination stories. But I can now with just with a going to the design menu accessing my themes, I can very quickly uh, change among these beautiful themes. And so you can imagine how this is gonna work if you're publishing a series of stories or have your stories all reflect the branding of your organization. Now it's a seamless uh, look and feel across collections and story maps, which is just really awesome. We've also added some additional quote styles so there are now, uh, I believe, uh, yeah, five or six different quote styles, but actually it's more than that because you can also decide to center your quotes. And of course you can, you can adjust type, typography and stuff like that. Uh, we've also uh, made zoom level options easier for map tours. Uh, and this I think is kind of important because I've seen too many tours where the, the scale is too small or you zoom too close in and it's, it can be hard to uh, understand where you are. So now you can set a scale overall. Let me re just a second. Let me reload this. Um, so this is just a little animation that shows you you can go uh, to set the custom zoom level and 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 change the default zoom for the whole tour. But you can also, and this is something I do a lot. You can go individually into each each point in the tour to set the zoom level to optimize to, to be optimized for just that particular point so that you know you might want to show the next tour point or a nearby landmark to orient people so that's a really useful little tool um, i'm i'm not going to get into the technicalities here but now you can set the story language of course story maps already accommodated a bunch of different languages but now if you can go into the settings it has to do it, it sort of talks to your browser and makes the uh, this um, multiple local language function uh, smoother and more seamless. Uh, I'll, uh, we'll put in the chat window links to a blog posts that go into more detail on this and are more articulate than my uh, uh, non-technical uh, tongue is capable of. Um, also there are video playback options in immersives now. Um, I really like this autoplay without control, uh, but of course it depends on on your circumstances, but it's nice within an immersive as you encounter it, if that, if your video automatically plays and loops, but again, you can set different options. Also, uh, of course, swipe has been a very popular uh, feature of story maps. And now you can, you can swipe within uh, sidecar and uh, uh, 
so you, it's just another way to kind of enrich the experience here, a couple of antique maps of Manhattan. Uh, there are also some new embed options. Again, I won't get into the technicalities, but, but often with an embed, if, there, if what's being embedded uh, has a scroll function, it can, it can interfere with the story scroll. And so you can opt to have that click to activate, but you may not need that. So you can now uh, have an embed that, uh, that you, gives you a little bit more flexibility. And again, for more information, you can see our colleague Owen Evans' blog posts. Uh, we, I, I just covered the last couple of releases. So, so they're summarized in, in these two blog posts, which I trust is, are going to uh, soon appear in the chat window if they aren't there already. And that does it. Uh, I'm gonna turn it back to, uh, to Ross. Thanks so much. Awesome, thanks so much, Alan. Um, so with all those new enhancements, we've got a poll that I'm gonna launch um, just to see uh, some feedback from you all who are attending this. Um, we're curious, what are you most excited about um, seeing uh, in terms of new features and enhancements um, that have just been implemented? I'll keep this poll open for about a minute. Um, so feel free to put in your response and then um, I'll share those out with the rest of the audience. Um, just as a reminder, as we wait, um, if you have any questions about ArcGIS story maps or what our featured storyteller is about to present on, uh, please use the Q&A um, feature. Um, that will allow uh, my colleagues to be able to answer those questions um, and for us to direct those questions um, after, after uh, for our final segment, which is the live Q&A. Okay, so the poll's been open for a little over a minute. And we've got a bunch of responses. Okay, I'm gonna share the results with you all. <laughs> okay, so let's look at the data. People are excited about map tour zoom level options. I, I have to agree, it's, it's really exciting. Expanding that. People are interesting. Map tour is really popular. Also, oh, I didn't scroll down far enough. Swipe in sidecar. Yes. Okay, excellent. Well, thanks so much for that feedback. Um, and continue to share your feedback, um, both in terms of questions you have as well as uh, comments. Um, so, questions again in the QA area, and then uh, use that chat feature as well. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to my favorite part of Story Maps Live, which is where we hear from folks who are actually using ArcGIS Story Maps um, in, out there in the world to solve problems. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Casey Palmer McGee, the GIS Program Manager for Samish Nation, Indian Nation in Washington State. Um, we are so excited to have you and really appreciate you taking the time to uh, share your really inspiring work with us all today. So with that, I'll hand things over, over to you. All right, can you, can you hear me all right? Yes, it sounds Awesome. Good. First, thank you guys so much for uh, having me today. It's uh, quite an honor. I'm very excited to go through some of these story maps and uh, talk about our experiences with them and what we're using them for. Um, as Ross mentioned, uh, my name is Casey Palmer McGee. I'm the GIS program manager for Samish Indian Nation. I'm also a field technician uh, within the Department of Natural Resources. So within, you know, I'll go ahead and share my screen so we can kind of see that, make sure I'm sharing the right one. Perfect. Um, within the Natural Resources Department, uh, we are involved in many different projects from marine debris cleanup to kelp monitoring to climate change to uh, organ spotted frogs. Um, I'll, I'll, that's one of my uh, story maps I'll showcase in, in a, shortly. 
Um, but we also do water quality analysis and prairie bald work. Um, I know that I miss, well, beach staining, I know that I'm missing some and I have some colleagues that are uh, watching this now and they're probably shaking their head at me. Um, but our mission at in the Natural Resources Department is to preserve and protect and enhance culturally significant natural resources for the present and the future generation. Um, so, and within the Department of Natural Resources, we're also grant funded. So meaning that funded through grants, we work with multiple projects or multiple partners and they, those can be Washington Department of Natural Resources, they can be US Fish and Wildlife, NOAA, State Fish and Wildlife, um, BLM, BIA, uh, the list goes on. Um, so it kind of opens up the opportunity to really, uh, really expand our work. And it's, and that's, that's part of what makes it really exciting to work for Samish. Um, today, I wanted to focus on four story maps that we're using, uh, well, that are being showcased, um, two within the natural resources department, and then two that are branching out of the natural resources department, one in our language program, and then one for admin, uh, because as I continue to build these story maps, we're starting to eat, we're starting to see they're just they're, they do so well at outreach and education um, that obviously there's a, a wide variety of use throughout uh, throughout uh, the Samish organization for them. Um, I wanted to share this screen with you. This is our kind of house of where our story maps are and placement for adding some. I find it very easy for people to locate the story maps this way rather than just providing one link, just having them listed in little pictures for each one really makes the accessibility super easy for people to come in and view them. So I'm gonna start with our marine debris cleanup story map, uh, and then I'll go into our OSF, Coast Sailors Place Names and Samish uh, timeline. And hopefully I'll have enough time to hit all of them. I meant to start my timer, I'll start it just, just because I like. I like to know. Um, so with our marine debris story map, this, this story map showcases the, feature, um, the efforts of cleaning up marine debris and creosote material in the San Juan Islands, which is located roughly here. Uh, that is also Samish traditional territory, which is highlighted in red here. Um, and that the active partners in that are Washington Department of Natural Resources, Washington Conservation Corps, Earth Corps, We've had uh, the Veterans Conservation Corps remove uh, creosote as well. Um, one thing to note about all of our story maps is this top section, uh, having the navigation bar up here has been perfect for just quick navigating through any of our story maps. But we, we focus on Samish culture because just as important as every project is for, for spreading uh, on a, a national, even global, scale, we want to make sure that Samish culture is also shared with the community and everyone. Um, so you'll notice that this is in each story map. So if you navigate to those and you start reading, there may be some redundancy here between each story map and learning, but uh, it's very important. And that kind of also gives us the uh, kind of a baseline for knowing that it's a Samish story map. Uh, you'll get your, tradi your Samish tradition first and then move on to the story map itself. So for marine debris and creosote, hopping back into that, um, this is a crew of four carrying a very large creosote piling and uh, it's heavy, you know, it's, it's a four man carry and often it's loaded onto boats. You'll see here that you have a, a good pile. There's, we can still stack some more on here, but um, it starts loading up and Washington Department of Natural Resources started this program in 2004 in South Puget Sound, um, which is south of San Juan Islands. I have to keep thinking. I'm, I'm in Bellingham, Washington. You guys are all over, so I have to refer back to my map in my head. Uh, south of the San Juan Islands or Samish Traditional Territory. Samish joined the cleanup effort in 2014, focusing in on that Samish Traditional Territory or San Juan Islands. Um, you know, we have a boat and we wanted to get involved. And so we, um, we joined partners with Wadi and R to start our cleanup. Um, you'll see 
clearly from the photos that it's a lot of uh, wood pilings often. The creosote soaked pilings, those pilings are toxic. They are very good at their job of building piers um, and decks. But over time, those the storm storms, big rain events, weather, they break loose and they wind up on beaches. Uh, and when they wind up on beaches, you get stuff that looks like this. It's toxic, it's sleet, you know, leaches into the soil, it's bad for marine ecosystems, it's bad for everything. Um, so one of our jobs is to clean up this San Juan Islands. And what Story Maps allows us to do is almost simplify it into something that we can share with everyone and, and show our efforts every year. So when we joined in 2014, our first year, this red lines, those are our track lines for everywhere we cleaned up. And we cleaned up 117,000 pounds of creosote and marine debris, um, which is a very large number. Uh, following that year, 2015, you can see we got a little more adventurous and we were able to highlight and clean up in a lot more areas. We had a longer cleanup season. Our cleanup season lasts, um, it's the summer months. It can start in May and go towards beginning of September. So, and we often work with WCC and DNR, they're the leads on this and they do all the heavy lifting and we are the taxi and navigating. Uh, you'll see some photos towards the end that um, will help bring that together. But you can see in 2016, uh, we continued our efforts and removed 120,000 pounds. Following that, we did 160,000 pounds. Though we had a fewer areas we visited, it's still a huge number. Um, and along with that, we started doing CREO surveys in the beginning of the year. And these red dots, uh, let me continue to scroll down. These red dots symbolize areas that, hopefully come on, light up, uh, areas that are, that we mapped prior to cleanup saying, there's a lot of CREO out here and there are, it's, it's pretty important that uh, these get cleaned up. So even though we've been cleaning up every year, the creosote continues to kind of flow back and come back in. And it may be coming from Strait of Juan de Fuca or Strait of Georgia or just piers breaking up in the middle. But so there's still work to be done out here. Um, and to give you an idea of the amount of creosote we've cleaned up is, I'm gonna get down to my graph, is roughly, 800,000 pounds of creosote have been cre cleaned up within the San Juan Islands. And these are our track lines for everywhere we've cleaned up. Um, and here is a graph. I've recently realized that I can build these graphs within, Arc within Story Map or ArcGIS and, and imprint them. So this, this was built in Excel. I will be moving it towards a more interactive style map that I can, I don't have to embed as a JPEG. Um, but you can see the San Juan Island, Lopez Island, those are high accumulation zones and Guaymas Islands in there. Um, so plenty of work to still be done there. Um, we did not survey in 2020 based off COVID, but uh, hopefully this year we'll get out and we'll do our surveys and clean up this year um, for 2021. And you can see that the story maps allows us to use photos as an option for, for people that you know, they can really see what we're doing and, and really interact with that and make it very easy to share with project partners that they can put in for reports, they can use it as grant deliverables, they can share it with additional partners. And so really helps get the, um, the word out about the movement of cleaning up marine debris and creosote. Um, also happy WCC crew before cleanup and then exhausted after Earth Corps and WCC crew and um, yeah, this, you know, the photos are always the empowering part. You, you can see here, I mean, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people moving one portion of one log over a leg just to get to the boat because this thing is so heavy and uh, full of creosote. Um, so this is a, one of the story maps I wanted to highlight is just the the ability to share so much through such a simple system. Um, and, you know, I've gone through it quickly. Please go, out, go over our, to our website and 
you know, read, read it all and, and learn a lot more. Um, from this story, I would like to kind of hop into our uh, OSF or Orchid Spotted Frog surveys, these little guys. Um, this is an effort for Samish Indian Nation and partners and our partners are US Fish and Wildlife, Washington Department of Fish and Wild Wildlife, Sustainability and Prisons Project and private landowners and volunteers. Um, so it's again, the ability through one program or through one software to share so many different partners coming together for one project. So it's, it's really awesome. Um, you'll also see here again, we have the Samish culture right at the beginning and the navigation toolbar to kind of hop around. So OSF are these little guys, uh, these little uh, brown frogs. They have black spots on them. They have little yellow golden eyes. The golden eyes often float right below the water. Um, they are endangered. Uh, they, in 1997, they were put on the endangered list. And in 2014, they were listed as threatened. You'll see the map below is their historical timeline or historical range, sorry, not timeline, but it's not a huge range, but it did take up a good amount of Oregon, some of California and Washington up here. Uh, and roughly that's, it's shrunk to around 75% of this and it's scattered throughout the area. Um, we have some reasons of decline, but they're also starting to show back up now. So I think it was in 1980s, they, they started to decline and, and they're finally starting to show back up. So it's really interesting. Um, I don't have an additional map here for the 75% loss. We're starting, you know, new, new sites and known sites are popping up all over, but the general range, the historical range is what we're hoping to see as the current range in the future. Um, why are these OSF declining? Well, this is a bullfrog. Bullfrogs are pretty wild. They eat the egg masses, they eat the eggs, they eat other egg masses, they eat other fishes, they eat everything. Um, we don't like them. <laughs> Sorry if you like them, but they are very, uh, they're mean frogs, they're bullies, bully frogs. These are one reason why they are declining. Uh, another reason are wetland and OSF habitat loss in the area due to possible construction and other industry. And another is this non-native plant invasion of reed canary grass, which was originally brought in as a farm cover crop. And it does a very good job at covering crop. Uh, it will grow in an area rapidly and it's very tall and it's very thick and it's very hard to get rid of. OSF like to lay eggs in very low shrubs. So these green areas down here are good habitat, um, but the invasion of canary grass have just really declined that area. Um, we, Samish got involved with surveys in, I believe 2013, this is our survey site. It's just a screenshot, but you can see this area of marshland. This is what they really like to lay in. This is always covered in Marie Canary grass in the seasons where they like to lay, typically April, March. We just finished our 2021 surveys. Uh, and then right over here is another survey. And we got involved in 2013 um, was where they were first sighted here. Uh, the data that I have only starts in 2017 for mapping it. So you'll see in pink here, 2017, we located egg masses towards the back end of this marshland area, followed that by, this is a very good picture, making it super easy. Again, story maps, the ability to share these images and you can see they're just big blobs of grape-like material. And it's pretty wild to see these in person. Uh, you'll see again, our, uh, our U.S. Fish and Wildlife partner and our field technician here just looking at this mass found. We're kind of worried about this one because it's in the more higher, drier area. They typically like to lay in, I believe, 10 to 15 centimeters of water. Um, but they, I think they know what they are doing. Most likely the water will get back over here and these eggs will be safe. Um, following this, though, you'll see 2017 right there. You'll see our 2018 come in. Um, in 2019, so this is all of our 2008, 17, 18, and 19 egg masses. In 2020, we were unable to survey because due to COVID, but in 2021, we surveyed. 
the interesting thing is at the end of the year in 2019, we did a massive restoration site on this side of the marshland. We, um, let me scroll down and this is always a good picture. Just wanted to be sure I got this one in. Another egg mass here and this idea so the reader can see how are we measuring these? How are we getting this data? We're actually using ArcPad uh, on a Mesa and, um, this year, we actually went to uh, ArcGIS Collector, which, in my opinion, is is much easier than ArcPad and it's very effective. I really enjoy using that for field use. It'll be used in all of our projects this year. So, our OSF restoration, those egg masses that where we laid, you'll see that in 2019 we decided to lay roughly where those egg masses were. These EVMs or emergent vegetative mats, and they are propagated by technicians in the Sustainability in Prisons Project. And the Sustainability in Prisons Project, their mission is to empower sustainable change by bringing nature, science, and environmental education into prisons. And you'll see from just these images here, this lush, green, awesome vegetation that OSF love. And this is what they wanna lay in, live in, and be in. It's like a giant mansion to live in. But you'll, um, this restoration work involved a, a bunch of mowing of reed canary grass. You can see, very excited to be, gun, be done with this plot. Uh, we use the slideshow, me slideshow me uh, method here, preparing the plots, mowing them. It took some time to get out there. This was all done in 2019. And immediately when we opened that channel, the water just started flowing into these plots, making this greener, lusher environment. From here, we laid down the OSF mat or the OSF EVM mats uh, that were supplied by Sustainability in Prisons Project. You'll see, I really favor using the slide so uh, the uh, sidecar method and showing how easy it is for uh, well, not easy. This was a lot of work, but just being able to show the amount of work that put in just by using the, the, the sidecar. And you'll see this, we've had them plotted at a different place. We towed them over to the EVM sites. We unloaded, we rode them over by boat. I think it took 14 times to get the 45 mats over to the other side. But just by having all these images and, and using this method, it really helps the reader feel like they're there and experiencing the same thing that we experienced. Um, Overall, this has been a good experience. In 2020, we did not uh, survey again, but when we went out in 2021, we found that the EVMs have taken hold. Um, this is a famous call. The OSF call is knocking your head, which uh, open your mouth, knock your head. I don't know if anyone's trying it right now, but it makes kind of like a door knock sound. And honestly, that's what OSF sound like. But you can see this lush green environment's gone down for them and we're starting to see some eggs come back to the area. Um, so again, just having the ability to share this, uh, this story map with project partners, with local and regional community, just to show what what Samish is doing out there, and we use them as grant deliverables, annual reports. It's just there's so much value in these story maps, and that's what we have found at Samish is how much value is behind it, and very excited to keep using them for future projects. Um, from here, I'm check my time, kind of skimming through. If you want to learn more, of course, go check out, uh, go check them out on our GIS data and story map uh, page. I want to mention two story maps outside of DNR, and these can be quick. The Coast Salish place names in the San Juan Islands is what we've been building with the language department. Uh, the language department wanted to visualize places within the San Juan Islands and not just visualize them, show present and past history of them and the Coast Salish names associated with those areas. So this story map is very short. You know, it's it's quick. It introduces right into the guided tour that was mentioned, um, that Alan mentioned, uh, the new features. I've been using that. And each location gives history. Here's a 
good example of Susha Island, right? Uh, it gives history of a place of harvesting mussels. That is what this word means. I am not going to pronounce that word. Uh, I will butcher it and it will not be good. However, one thing we could do is click here to listen. It pops up a new tab and gives you a sound bar. Uh, and it's, it's an external sound bar. Um, I'm not sure if you can hear it. But that is one to come visit at our site. Uh, hopefully soon I will be uh, able to embed those audio bars within the guided tour. Um, that feature is not available yet, but maybe it's in the future. I don't know. And um, it just allows you to navigate through the San Juan Islands and see these areas and learn about the past and the present of what these areas look like. This, it's. I always like to use the Guaymas Island Ferry Terminal as, as one example here. And I'll scroll up and I'll just get a picture of it really fast. It's this one right here. It's it's having the orcas right here in the in the front group and just beautiful. And, and then the, the ferry terminal in the background, but this is home to the Guaymas Ferry Terminal, but it was a historic village site for Samish um, in the, for, until, you know, existed in Guaymas Island until the first decade in the 1900s. And again, you can pop out and you can learn how to say it, pronounce it, and then you can read more about it. Um, highly recommend the guided tour for, for things just like this. It's, it's an awesome feature. Uh, the last story map I wanna feature is our Samish Indian Nation timeline. I got about two minutes, I believe. The Samish Indian Nation timeline is exactly that. It's the timeline of Samish Nation from 14,400 years ago to the present day. It takes you through the history of Samish. And this, I wanted to show this because there's not one map within this story. It's a super effective story that it's all photos and it's all, it's just a ton of photos that are powerful and it just, it helps bring together that history of Samish. And before story map, before the timeline was featured in story maps, it was Microsoft Sway. So a good system, but if you're familiar with it, it is kind of clunky. It's kind of hard to share with people. Uh, now the ability to share this with just the link to people, share it on our Facebook, Twitter, it's so much easier to do. And it's also, it's a full screen method. And I don't know, black and white photos always, always interest me a lot more and just having the ability to, to show that, you know, this being from 1927, this recorded document working with archives and, and our, and World War II right here and, and Native, uh, Native Americans who were brought into World War II. It's a very effective tool for showing history and past, but also it's design of showing what we're going to do in the future as well. Uh, and this timeline, one of the requirements was for it to be embedded into our site. So when we navigate here, we can go to our timeline and it will scroll down. And this embedment or embedding of the story map has worked very well. Our IT department, uh, this was embedded before that embed feature, before we had it. So they did a great job putting this together, giving you the ability to full screen, open in a new window. Uh, and I hope that all of our story maps will now navigate towards that. So where when you click on one, you don't have to go to an external feature. You actually go with into, into another window that is still on our page to help keep visitors on our page. Um, I think with that, I will take it, and I'll just send it back to Ross. That was a, a quick and uh, very quick way. We have additional stories here that our climate change story map which is a great read, our uh, bull kelp in the San Juan Islands or Samish traditional territory, and this additional application here uh, for sea level rise. Um, they've all been awesome and people really like them. <laughs> okay, I'm done. <laughs> awesome, Casey, that was so fun to see you present and talk about your process and background. Um, so we want to open it up now for questions uh, from the audience. Um, so feel free to use the Q&A feature to uh, post any questions that you have for Casey or about um, ArcGIS story maps. Um, so great. Yeah, let's take a look. 
Awesome. Thanks, Ross. And thank you so much, Casey. That was incredible. I'm always so amazed by, by the work that you're doing. Um, the first question that I want to ask you is, do you have any upcoming stories that you're working on that you can tell us a little bit about? Yes, uh, we have one called uh, 13 Moons, and I'm actually going to pull it up on the online um, one of those, that's an additional story map that we're using with, or that we're developing with our language department. And I want, I actually have a draft version that's published right now that I probably can share. That would be really great to show just the beginning of it. Um, so you can get an idea because it's hard for, it can be explained, but it's better just to show it a little while I'm explaining it, if that's okay. Um, Go for it. And that story map is loading, loading, loading. Let me share that screen again. Perfect. And it might load. But the 13 moons calendar, this is our most recent one. And this takes a, a look at the indigenous calendar uh, versus the month to month calendar. So the 13 moons will be something that 13 moons is one calendar year and it's a, it's Samish uh, moons as well as Coast Salish indigenous calendar. Um, and I'll give that a second to load. You'll see right here all of the moons that are drawn and they're drawn by Annabelle Baker and she did a fabulous job of uh, describing these moons. Each moon cycle uh, means a different uh, a different thing and, and symbolizes a new entrance into the, a new season. Um, but this this story map will be a very good one. Sorry, it's loading slow, but you know, we'll look at it. It looks at the Samish culture and its connection to the seasonal cycle. Um, and then each 13 moon marks the need or ready to themselves to change each season to begin new activities throughout the seasonal cycle. So instead of the month to month, it's you have the first season has, for instance, four moons in it. And these four moons are also pronounced in this awesome audio file that'll just run and it'll explain each one. Uh, and within this feature, I'm also using that image gallery technique that, that just popped, that just came out that I really like because before this system, I was using Photoshop to stretch and manipulate, put things together. But it's, the development of this, I, I will really enjoy when this one's complete and it will show each season and the moon phases throughout that season, and what those moons mean. For instance, this one here is um, moon of blossoming, which is March. So it, I don't wanna say much more than that because you know it's still in development and, and we're changing things constantly, but it's going to have quotes in there from Samish tribal citizens, and uh, it's going to have videos of uh, seasonal plants and harvesting them and, and uh, everything's pronounced, how everything's pronounced, and it, it's, it's a very exciting story map that is uh, almost, almost ready to be announced and released. Awesome. Thank you so much for, for sharing that preview for us. I'm really excited for this to come out. Um, we have a few more questions for you in the chat. Uh, one of them uh, kind of gets at the idea of, of crowdsourcing, right? So is there a story where the Samish tribe can share or post stories or photos? Um, so is there a story where they can, where well, how should I answer that one? Um, for the Samish timeline, at the end of it, we often ask if you would like to contribute to email uh, and reach out to our uh, Samish archivist, which is Jason, Jason Tickner. And with any uh, photography, documents, anything that's related to Samish Indian Nation that you would like to donate. So is that is that what you're asking of, of where people can send photos for that who are Samish or who are general public that may have information on Samish? No, I believe it's it's for, I think the human who was asking it wanted to know if there was a place for for Samish to, to contribute photos or information. Yeah, I would say it's, it, it's, 
if you would like to contribute photos or information, just email samish at samishtribe.nsn.us. And with that, those photos and information and uh, all information is welcome. Awesome, that's great to know. Uh, can you share a little bit about the process or steps um, that you take for a story um, going, going through kind of ideation to even getting it approved for publication? Sure. It was really great to see the start of your upcoming story, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about your process. Yeah, the process is really interesting because working within my department, uh, DNR, often we already know our projects and um, we have project leads for each project. And usually I get with that project lead uh, and I honestly, I ask them to build a PowerPoint. I say, start with a PowerPoint. It's a rough draft. Give me those images that you want to put in there. Some of that word, some of the wording you want, and then we can go from there. And then, um, <laughs> you know, it's been lucky. Often I just take that PowerPoint and I spend a week putting something together. And that's my first draft. I send it over to them. It could be completely wrong. Um, and they may want to go a completely different direction, but that is my method so far for doing it, uh, especially with being um, outside of the department. So for instance, with our language group, often developing that 13 moons calendar, I actually developed it from a Google doc. It was just wording and wording and wording and words, and uh, there weren't many images. And so I ripped the document apart and tried to create paragraphs. And then I associate an image with each paragraph. And, and again, the best method that I have seen though is asking that person to put together their own presentation of what they, what they would like to see using PowerPoint. Uh, and then I take that PowerPoint, I add more words, I add the videos that I find appropriate, I ask them for additional photos, and then I send them published draft documents. Um, and it's worked pretty well. Uh, It'd be, it'd be good if there was a, a better application style, um, I, you know, and, and being able to send them a draft document that they can write in or text in would be so amazing because when I share, uh, when I share these uh, unpublished, published story maps so they can see the final product without them being part of the organization, they, they don't have the ability to write on them. So they, I, the best method I have found there is, okay, open a Word document next to it. And then when you are, when you are find a, an error or something you wanna change, make note of it in the Word document and then send me that Word document. So if there were the ability to go in and add your own edits to a draft story map and you're outside of the organization, but you can see a final product, or just a draft format, then um, that would make it a lot easier. And also just working back and forth with someone. Prior to COVID, obviously being in the office, I could schedule meetings and we could just go through it right there next to each other. And um, that it, it was easier. And then working with our department, language department right now, developing the 13 moons, it's, it's still easy, it's, it's, it's fun. Um, but it would be nice to, yeah, send them a final document and have them be able to write in it. Awesome, thanks so much for telling us a little bit more about your process. Um, one of the questions that came up in the question and answer section had to do with some survey data that you showed over time. And so for showing survey data over time, what was used to place the data that you had on the photo? Um, are you referring to probably the creosote material and um, maybe I'm, maybe that one what was well I'm so not really sure which one it's referring to but maybe you could tell us a little bit about your workflow for uh showing showing survey data for showing information that you collect over time uh in your sure. stories sure yeah um often throughout uh, over time, so for each year we've collected using a mobile GPS unit, whether it's an Archer, uh, Juniper Systems Archer with ArcPad on it, 
or the Mesa that we have now that has ArcPad as well as GIS Collector. Uh, the GIS Collector app makes it very easy to record that data over time because it's sent to an ArcGIS online document, right? And so it's much easier to put that data into story maps. Um, with our prior to, well, I believe in 2014, you know, the track lines we made, uh, there was uh, some digitizing that was involved. And actually when you got home for the day after being out there doing your cleanup, I would ask the, the captain, okay, I need you to mark on here everywhere we cleaned, you know, sections of the islands. And then I went in and, and drew the shape files and then zipped it and uploaded it into ArcGIS online. Um, for the survey data where we collected prior to cleanup, we have all those individual dots. That was all done through uh, ArcPad or Arc Collector. And uh, where then when I got home in the office, downloaded, put it into ArcGIS, clean it up a little, zip it, and upload it into ArcGIS story maps. Um, and it, and it has worked out very well that way. I'm, I'm more excited about using ArcGIS Collector, which is what we're gonna go to just because of how the ability to have it already in ArcGIS online. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's my process for, for collecting it over time. And, and looking back at data, you know, luckily we did a good job of documenting past, um, past GIS work or past cleanup, cleanup areas um, that was a, that was a big one, you know, just making sure that you're always recording everywhere you go. Yeah. Data collection, cleanup. It's, it's really important to the storytelling process and just your general, uh, GIS workflow. I've, mm -hmm. I have done some digitizing of data myself. So I'm, I'm, I'm very familiar with what, what you had to do to, to get those beautiful maps you showed in your first story. Um, yeah. yeah, we, uh, <laughs> one project that we've done that I did not mention in the, uh, the kelp story map, the titled Decade of Disappearance, uh, it's a bull kelp in the San Juan Islands. Uh, we got a hold of some six inch high resolution imagery for San Juan Island and, uh, it's a bunch of fringing beds, so it doesn't often do well of being picked up through remote sensing techniques. So when our, my answer to that was, okay, let's digitize it. And so we digitized um, roughly 600 acres of kelp within the islands. And uh, I mean, the imagery was crystal clear and, and, and it worked very well, but yeah, that, um, it took some time, but at least you know you're doing it right and there's no errors. And uh, that's a good story map to read through. And, and we actually just obtained some additional imagery that we're gonna continue to digitize and, and compare to those data sets. That's, that's incredibly impressive. I can't wait to take a look at that story and hopefully one of my colleagues will drop the link to it in the chat. So our, our participants and attendees can, can take a look at that. Um, Definitely. I think we have about time for maybe one more question. Um, and I'm going to ask you um, one that's always my favorite to ask people. What is your favorite uh, block to use in your story and why? You know, which block like really helps your storytelling or, or, or gets, it's, gets the point across that you want? Are you saying which feature in there, which block? Yeah. Uh, I would absolutely say it's the sidecar method for right now, um, because as you see throughout all of the stories, I mean, that having it be a floater text box over the image or linking the image to the text, I mean, it helps just bring it all together because I would rather have a list of, of photos that you could just look through because you can interpret those photos so well versus having the text. But having that sidecar right there, the ability to stretch it now and make it half size image so it's not just a long strand of text on the left. I thought like it was such a simple improvement, but I was like, oh, finally, yes, this makes sense. Um, and be able to flop it back and forth uh, to, depending on which side. But the sidecar method, um, absolutely is essential in my mind just just for 
for showing any any maps, videos, uh, anything where you know you can get the point across through the image rather than the reader having to read. I'm not saying we don't like to read, but you know, I often enjoy looking at photos and interpreting it in my own way, you know, and seeing like in a photo of marine debris cleanup, the struggles of lifting 400 pounds worth of, of wood, I can type that, but if I can say, hey, this is a thousand piece of wood, and then the picture on the right shows six people carrying it, it just, all of a sudden, just having those linked together really does help bring it together. Um, I will say that I'm pretty excited about the image gallery update there and um with the with the two story maps i shared uh with the streaming of the photos at the end that's because i wanted people to be engaged and see the efforts so being able to load those up and having you know the 12 images in one big block that people can just click on and go through i think that's going to be great too so i'll be going back and swapping those out definitely that's awesome those are those are such great answers um I love a good sidecar and really agree that, you know, multimedia images really supplement your narrative. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of cliche sayings out there about what photos can do to augment a story, but, you know, they do ring true. Uh, and with that, I think we've, we've kind of run out of time for our question and answer. So I'm going to throw it back over to Ross to, to wrap us up. Uh, thank you so much, Casey. Really yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. It. Thank you guys. Thanks, Liz, and thanks, Casey, for being our featured storyteller. Um, we've been sharing links to your amazing stories um, in the chat and getting some really great feedback from our attendees. Um, so continue to check out those links, read them, read them over, and be inspired by this incredible work. Um, as always, for those of you who are just getting started with ArcGIS Story Maps, um, the best place to go is esri.com slash story maps to get started. Um, there's lots of resources on that page from blog posts to instructional stories. Um, we're doing some evergreen videos now just about storytelling techniques. So um, be sure to check that out. Uh, we update their website um, almost daily. Um, so there's new content coming out all the time. Um, <clears throat> and just a reminder that this recording will be made available um, after the session. Um, and so you can have it as a reference to go back to and, and continue to be inspired. Um, there was a question earlier about seeing previous episodes um, in the chat window. We've archived all of those and they're on our YouTube channel. So definitely check those out um, when you have a moment. Uh, so with that, I wanna thank um, all of you for attending and thank you in particular, Casey, for the amazing and inspiring work that you're doing. Thank you. Thanks, Casey. Thanks, everybody.